It is now my great pleasure to introduce my co-president, Sally Charno of Hofstra University, who's the one who came up with the great idea for this series. Sally? Hi, everyone. I'm just figuring this out. Uh, this I, let's see. <laughs> I'm just trying to put a spotlight on it, but it's not working. Maybe you can do it, Jeff. Anyway, thank you, Jeff. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ruth Ginio, who, just to give you a sense of our, of our uh, structure today, she will then introduce our two authors and offer some comments and questions, at which point we will then open the chat for your questions and thoughts. Um, just to be clear, and we'll remind you throughout, we're asking you to address all questions to Jeff Jeff Horn in the chat, he's the one who's going to be organizing them. So G Ruth Ginio is an associate professor in the Department of History at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. He is the author of two books, The French Army and Its African Soldiers, The Years of Decolonization, which came out in 2017 from Nebraska, and an earlier work, French Colonialism Unmasked, the Vichy Years in French West Africa, also from Nebraska in 2006. She has two current research projects. The first focuses on murder investigations in West Africa, and the second, a particular investigation on the Jean Day affair in Senegal, which occurred in the late 19th century. Professor Ginio has published numerous articles and book chapters and has edited two volumes. The first, with Efrat Ben Zaev and Jay Winter entitled Shadows of War, A History of Silence in the 20th Century, came out in, with Cambridge in 2010, and the second with Paul Alualia and Louise Bethlehem entitled Violence and Nonviolence, African Perspectives, which came from Rutledge in 2007. So again, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to Professor Ginio. Thank you. Thank you. Um, should I do something or just, okay. Oh, you just go. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I managed to see uh, from the screens of this kind of a uh, squares that we lived, we, we learned to live with during the last year, uh, many of, of my colleagues and friends, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, to see them. It's a shame that we can't share a glass of beer, but some other time, hopefully soon. Um, what I'm going to do now is that I, I'm going to present um, uh, both uh, speakers who have the same name, so <laughs> I'll just say uh, Sarah F or Sarah Z or whatever. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll present uh, first alphabetically uh, ordered Sarah Frank, um, and she will present her book uh, briefly, like a few minutes. Uh, and then uh, Sarah Zimmerman, who pre will present her book. I'll then just say a few words very shortly, very briefly uh, about uh, both books and then present uh, questions um, uh, so to, to, to link both books because this is a kind of a double, double interview. Um, so first, uh, Sarah Frank. Um, Sarah Frank is a social and military historian specializing uh, in the French Empire during the 20th century. She's an associate lecturer of modern history at the University of St. Andrews and an external research fellow at the International Studies Group at the University of the Free State in long, long, long time, uh, South Africa. She's particularly interested in the everyday experiences of soldiers and their families under colonial rule. Uh, the book uh, that, that she's going to present today uh, called Hostages of Empire, and it stems from her doctoral research at Trinity College Dublin, which was funded by the Irish Research Council. Uh, Sarah began a new research project recently, uh, focusing on the post-war experiences of colonial soldiers and their families in the decades leading towards decolonization. So Sarah, please, uh, who is yours? Thank you, Ruth. Um, so I know I only have minutes, I think, so I'll get right into it. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a really exciting opportunity for 
I think both Sarah's and hopefully Ruth as well. Um, my book centers around the approximately 85,000 French colonial soldiers who were captured by the Germans during May and June 1940. So at its heart, it's a social history of these men's lived experiences of captivity, which took place mostly in occupied France. So unlike white French POWs who are taken to Germany for their wartime captivity, colonial prisoners are interned in camps across the occupied zone of France in what boils down to a racial separation of POW. So from there, the book turns on two central questions. How did the colonial prisoners survive daily life in captivity? And what does the colonial prisoners' captivity tell us about French imperialism generally and Vichy's imperial goals more specifically? But to answer those questions, I've got three main arguments. First, after the defeat and significant territorial losses in the metropole, the future of French greatness or grandeur depended on having and being an empire. Therefore, the Vichy regime actively improved conditions of captivity for colonial prisoners in an attempt to guarantee their continued and future loyalty. And we can and we should unpick what loyalty even means. Secondly, French benevolence, if you will, um, towards colonial prisoners was part of a broader framework of racial difference and hierarchy. As such, the relatively dignified treatment of colonial prisoners must be viewed as a paradox in light of Vichy and free French racism in the colonies and the Vichy regime's complicity in the Holocaust. And finally, the colonial prisoners' experiences of captivity, combined with persistent French rhetoric of imperial solidarity, led many to believe that the relationship between colonizers and those subject to colonial rule was finally shifting, and the subsequent backtracking further strained relations between France and the former colonial prisoners. The Hostages of Empire presents a new social history of captivity, of imperialism, and global humanitarianism during the Second World War. And it puts the colonial soldiers themselves at the heart of the story, and argues that French attitudes towards colonial POWs were directly connected to imperialism and clinging to colonial rule at a time when that seemed increasingly under threat. Furthermore, the captivity of the colonial prisoners was an inherently imperial one based on a different political and military agenda than that of the white French prisoners. So the French developed an imperial vision for maintaining future control of the empire in which the colonial prisoners were but the colonial prisoners were not mere pawns in this larger diplomatic game. And despite the difficulties, they managed to shape their conditions of captivity, friendships, cooking their own food, or centering a salary home, their work salary home. The French, who are worried that German propaganda is going to lead their colonial prisoners astray, wanted them released, or failing that, in closer contact with the French, and they were willing to contribute financially to obtain this. So with the colonial prisoners, the Vichy regime believed it had um, opportunity to influence a group of men who would hold sway upon their return home to the colonies and who needed French protection to survive captivity, which itself springs from the broader belief that the colonies needed France to modernize and to civilize them, which obviously is not something I believe. But surprisingly, this paternalism led to care and not to neglect, as has been previously argued. Um, colonial prisoners ate and worked alongside French civilians. Appropriate friendships were encouraged, and aid agencies worked together to improve the physical and affective conditions of captivity. The French administration treated the colonial prisoners' complaints about conditions, guards, or fellow prisoners as legitimate and worthy of consideration. And as prisoners of war, they had more contact with white French than they would have in time in the colonies, or even when in peacetime in the metropole. But more importantly, the individual prisoners could shape these interactions, choosing whether to seek a godmother for letters during captivity, or a trusted friend who might help them escape. These increased interactions between colonial prisoners and white French, and the ability to raise concern and receive considered responses, signaled to many colonial prisoners that some of the rigid delineations of French colonialism had been suspended during this kind of liminal period between war and peace. And indeed, I argue that something did change during the colonial prisoners' captivity. The solidarity becomes increasingly vernacular, 
small acts like bringing a colonial prisoner food, created bonds, giver and receiver, while larger acts like helping a colonial prisoner escape from captivity or sneaking him across the demarcation line created shared experiences between men and women from the metropole and the empire, which might not have occurred under normal circumstances. The combination of this official rhetoric, unofficial and sincere, sincere support from some locals made a significant difference in the colonial prisoners experience in France. But in return, colonial prisoners were expected to remain loyal to France. And French support continued while these colonial prisoners were considered at risk of contamination by German propaganda. And we can talk hopefully a little bit more about that in the question. But again, the huge caveat is that this surprising leniency towards the colonial prisoners, especially when placed in the larger context of the Vichy regime's racist policies, policies in the colonies, and its absolute refusal to protect Jews from the Nazi regime, must be understood as part of the regime's desire to keep the power conferred by controlling the empire. As such, the Vichy regime's ability and desire to protect the colonial prisoners from a worse experience than had they been interned in Germany is paradoxical. Indeed, once they come back under French control, either in the unoccupied zone or in the colonies, the solidarity evaporated and is replaced by discipline. And there's a, a noticeable change in the language that's used in the primary sources. The former colonial prisoners' complaints and desires are no longer viewed as legitimate, Instead, any questioning or any protest is seen as stepping stone to outright rebellion and it's suppressed as such. So much to the colonial soldiers' justifiable frustration and anger, this reasserted their place as racialized subjects in an imperial nation. So just to kind of quickly conclude, um, colonial captivity served as a reminder that race remained the silent qualifier of belonging in France in the 20th century. Expressions of French imperial solidarity did not begin with the Vichy regime. The people subject to French colonial rule were well aware that solidarity, like liberty, equality, and fraternity, meant very different things for white citizens than for people of color and citizens of color. For example, when war was declared, imperial solidarity meant constricting men from the colonies to fight in Europe for lower pay, a smaller pension, and fewer rights than the white soldiers. But while in captivity, however, French calls for solidarity are backed up by concrete efforts to bring the prisoners food, to improve their shelters, and to ease the tedium of being a POW. Still, the question of the colonial prisoners' race impacted their fate in captivity in ways white prisoners did not face. So colonialism, despite claims of bringing improved infrastructure or civilizing power, is fundamentally or was fundamentally a racist institution. And the conscription of colonial soldiers in its defense was by the very nature problematic. But I argue that racism here is not a static position. It took many different forms, changed over times, and affected the colonial soldiers in different ways before, after, and during their captivity. So French, German, and racial views shaped the legal and the physical framework for the colonial soldiers' experiences of war. The French generally viewed most colonial soldiers and indeed most of the colonial subjects as children in need of French guidance. Um, this paternalistic attitude, influenced by the importance of the French Empire, the home to the colonial soldiers, to the Vichy regime, meant that the colonial prisoners of war were not neglected, which is a huge change in our understanding of wartime captivity. However, it's essential to remember that solicitude or benevolence, which is founded on assumptions of white support of white superiority, is not the same as benevolence. So I think that's probably where I should stop for now. Um, hopefully you'll have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'll now present uh, our second Sarah, Sarah Zimmerman. Uh, Sarah Zimmerman is an associate professor of history at Western uh, Washington University. Her research focuses on women and gender in West Africa, French Empire, and the Atlantic uh, world. Her first monograph, which is the book that we are going to discuss today is Militariz Militarizing Marriage, West African Soldiers, Conjugal Traditions in Modern, uh, in modern French Empire. And um, her uh, new research uh, focuses on the gender production of history and memory on Gore Island, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in, site in Senegal. So uh, please, sir, go ahead. Your turn. <laughs> 
Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Sarah Frank for um, getting all of this started and studies. Um, I'm going to try to give a very a brief uh, overview of the book and what it does, um, and hopefully uh, make it clear as to kind of scope and so. Conjugal relationships between West African soldiers and women uh, from across French Empire center my inquiry concerning marital legitimacy at the heart of French of the heart of the French imperial militarization, the tirailleur syndrome. By tightly focusing on conjugality, sexuality, and women within the history of the tirailleurs melee, the book follows the evolution from the 1880s to the and from West Africa to French Indochina. Um, I'm going to kind of lay out three major kind of thematic yes, book. So the first is um, from the vantage of West African traditions, I was able to center women, gender, and sexuality within histories of militarization, institutions, and uh, I have shown how colonized women violence and heteronormativity were integral components of a military institution that made, maintained, and defended French. The second major theme are kind of marital traditions, law, those things in Africa and French Empire. African military households sat at the convergence of West African French and military traditions of marriage within spaces of colonial conflict. African soldiers ability to families and shape colonial and local ideas of marriage were paramount to the manifestation of power in the intimate space. Marriage as an institution provides us with access uh, to household. Um, marriage as an institution uh, was an integral component of political history in West Africa and Empire. Just as households that I discuss were sites of and instead of shoring up boundaries between public and private, African military health transcended these categories. They eroded distinctions between military and um, In the case of Tayo Senegale and uh, subjects, marriage could secure legal status, provide access. Is and uh, the third prong is about interventions in colonial concepts, chronology, space, mobility. The Tiraillers Senegalais and their households were protagonists, international enterprise, stretched. Tiraillers Senegalais and their wives challenged the chronology affiliated with the concept and legacy. Militarizing marriage uh, places emphasis on migration, female colonial subject, empire. African military households uh, participated in South South migration, and these cross colonial movements challenged the core periphery model of colonial history, where information and historical reality flow unidirect, unidirect direction from uh, the French metropolitan. Um, and so I wanted to kind of lay out really quickly the content chapters just because they move across space and time. So the content chapters trace uh, these major themes from the 1880s aftermath from West Africa to China. I ground the book's major lines of inquiry in historical debates pertinent to local context. Chapter one addresses West African colonial conquest or French in West Africa uh, during the 1880s and 1890s highlights how African soldiers' conjugal relationships formed at the confluence of war, slavery, and emancipation, which in turn served as the shifting foundation for military policies and practices concerning the legitimacy of Tiraillers household. Um, chapter two follows West African military employees 
two French conquests in Congo and Madagascar in the final decade. Um, in these sites, Madagascar and Congo, West African soldiers sought local wives. Their inter-African conjugal household inspired multiple stakeholders, local community, military, um, military soldiers to contest conjugal household. Chapter three follows Terrier Senegalais to the conquest of Morocco between 1908 to 18 and examines how perceptions of race to different influence military officials boundaries. North African of Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa. West African military wives key in maintaining this boundary. Why you have a proportion of cards um, that come from this campaign feature West African health. Um, the last point of that chapter is um, I use a historical of the Abid al Bukhari, which is a historical Moroccan institution, to draw a comparison. Chapter four examines um, the critical transformations of West African soldiers between 1914 and 1918. I don't go to France in this chapter. Um, I really focus um, on the Blaise-Gen laws of World War I, which um, emphasize the difference between French West African citizens, or the originaire, and um, the rest of French West Africa remained subjects. This division was critical for bifurcating West African marital traditions and their access to benefits and their ability to legitimize their conflict. Chapter five examines evolution in how military officials supported or did not support long distance West African cross Looking at families that were split across West Africa, Morocco, West Africa, Syria, West Africa, and in the imperial. Chapter six examines Afro Vietnamese households in Southeast Asia and West Africa from the 1930s. In this chapter, the peripheries of French empire demand that we think operate race, sexuality, and family outside of the colonizer colonizer binary. The epilogue appraises African military household experiences in the final decades of Terrier, uh, in the final decades of the existence of Terrier Senegalese, as well as during the decolonization of Algeria and Africa, and thinks through their legacy up through. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, so I just uh, uh, received already one chat. <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, clarify something about the questions. Uh, after I'm, I'm uh, finish um, my short remarks, I'll open the, the chat. Um, questions should be addressed to Jeff, okay? Not personally to me because I'm not I'm not going to deal with the questions. Jeff's going to transmit transmit them to uh, uh, to me. Uh, and I will uh, ask a few of my own questions and then turn to the questions from the audience. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm, I was very happy that uh, Sarah and Sarah, uh, who I know very well, uh, and I can call my friends if I'm allowed to, <laughs> uh, uh, ask me to, to, to interview, to, to conduct this interview. Um, I've been working on the on African colonial soldiers for like a decade. I'm no I no longer work uh, on this subject, but this subject kind of uh, follows me around still. That often happens. Uh, you'll see it will happen to you too. Um, so um, I just uh, wanted to say a few words about my perspective on on the subject and the importance of these uh, these two wonderful books that I recommend everyone to read. Um, well, the first the first pioneering work about African colonial soldiers was published by uh, Professor Myron Eckenberg in 1990, and this is a very interesting case because he, his book was well there were maybe some others, but this was the major uh, only major work about this subject, and then there was silence for like 
I don't know, 13, 14 years, nothing, almost nothing was written about this subject as if this book kind of finished, the, the, finished the, this, uh, this business. But uh, the beginning of the 2000s, year 2000, about, I think, uh, um, the first, first three years of the, of the 2000s, uh, there has, this has been a great change in this uh, tendency. I mean, there were so many, so many works written about the theory of Senegal. It wasn't a coincidence. I think it was related to, to some political issues <clears throat> that, uh, that, that kind of came up during this, uh, this uh, period, specifically the uh, 2003 ceremony in Provence. Uh, this was the first time where the ceremony took place, uh, the ceremony for, for the liberation of France took place in Provence and not in Normandy. Uh, from what I read it, the main reason was to annoy the Americans, but uh, uh, the, the consequence of this was that uh, so that a major focus was, was put on the role of African soldiers in the liberation uh, of Provence. So it was like 150,000 uh, uh, colonial soldiers out of, uh, uh, out of I think, uh, uh, five, 500,000. So that was a, a great percentage of soldiers. And uh, research started, began. And uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, Actually, what, what, what's interesting about it, about this research was uh, that it was uh, very emotional sometimes, uh, especially, especially from, from French scholars. Um, and because it was deeply related to the feeling that this is not something in the past, it is still in the present. A lot of discrimination against African soldiers and especially the issue of pensions. Uh, the, the freezing of the pensions in 1959 that was uh, still uh, uh, under debate and uh, uh, in France and and, and elsewhere uh, and and these emotions uh, even in one specific case ended in a French court so it was really uh, uh, quite quite a, a, an emotional subject what what's really fascinating and, and great about the two books that we discussed today in my view is that they look at this subject, only as a prism for a better understanding of general themes and questions related to French colonial history in French colonial history and, and uh, uh, the history of World War II in the, in the case of Sarah Frank, uh, more on African history uh, and uh, imperial but the kind of uh, interrelations between uh, different regions of the empire in the case of Sarah Zimmerman. And despite the abundance of uh, abundance of, of, of studies on um, African soldiers, both books uh, offer new and refreshing perspectives and uh, uh, open new found territories in the field. They integrate well the military sphere into its wider context. Um, and uh, uh, what's actually uh, interesting about about these two books, I think, is both of them uh, well. Uh, they're quite different in their perspectives, as I said. I mean, Sarah's Frank book discusses more uh, France and uh, and the imperial and global history, uh, while Sarah Zimmerman uh, actually uh, focuses more on, on the local uh, importance of the of the Thierry Senegalais. Uh, but they both uh, uh, focus on 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 people. Uh, I mean, what I really liked about these books is that you have general ideas and theories and everything but you have also stories you you can see the people in them uh, and uh, this is for me was uh, something that i uh, admired a lot uh, i really have so much to say about these books and then as i said they are both, both fascinating to read and actually i think they benefit anyone who is interested in colonial history not only french colonial history so uh not not only people who are specifically interested in the story of the colonial soldiers. Uh, but I will stop now uh, because the idea of this encounter is to hear about the books and the experience of writing from the authors. Uh, so I'll now um, the chat is now open uh, uh, for questions. Uh, so you can just start uh, asking or writing the question and I will present them to the uh, to both uh, Sarah's uh, after, after a few of my questions. Uh, okay, so so let me start by a, a short question. Uh, I didn't send it to you in advance. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, <laughs> no, no. That's that's not a frightening question at all. Uh, 
why about the choice of subject i mean this is something that uh, i always find intriguing uh, why people decide to write about a specific subject uh, i know that this is this is a, the first book for you both although as as far as i remember sarah's uh, phd was quite different right it's not, it's not i mean it wasn't about uh, women specifically uh, Sarah Zimmerman, I mean, sorry, I have to remember <laughs> to mention the name. Uh, so uh, if you can just say briefly, both of you can say a few words of why were you attracted to this specific uh, subject? Uh, Sarah Frank before, sorry, yeah, because so then we'll, we'll do the rest. So I applied to do a PhD saying that I was going to work on Imperial Propaganda in French West Africa, and then a really good book on Vichy's propaganda in French West Africa came out like two months into my PhD, which is obviously your book, Ruth. Um, <laughs> so I had to, <laughs> it's okay, I have read past page six. Um, so I had to pivot. Um, and I think one of the things I wanted to look at was continuities. I wanted to understand what the empire meant as a symbol. And I was definitely not going to do military history. I wasn't going to look at POWs. That was a terrible idea. Military history was boring. And then I started to think about it a bit more. And actually, military history is a lot more fun than I had given it credit for. And what I liked about looking at POWs is I didn't have to choose um, a part of the empire to focus on. Like, I didn't have to decide, are you going to do Algeria or Senegal? Are you going to do French Equatorial Africa or Indochina? Like with the POW, the colonial POWs, you get to look at the empire as a whole and people from all parts of the empire in different situations and what, what their lived experiences were and how those lived experiences are politicized. So that's why I... And then you know, military history is actually way better now than I thought it was going to. Be. So I might stick with it for a while. Well, so, sorry about what I did to you, but someone else did it to me years ago. Well, and then <laughs> Raphael Sheck did it to me again. So, <laughs> okay. So, Sarah, is anyone? Yeah. yeah so um, I'll answer this, but then I'll also tip us to your methodology question that you did send around. So um, what I initially, how I initially became interested in Terrarius Senegale was from some case studies that were the end of Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, where he addresses um, some of the issues that are going on in torture chamber in um, the Algerian war. And he mentions that Terrarius Senegale are in them. And I became very interested in trying to understand trans-Saharan relations during the period. Um, and trying to think about that through racial um, Arabic was a, was a little hard for me, um, but I, you know, went into um, PhDs, uh, into doing PhD research, thinking I would follow the program. Tyler Stovall is in the audience, he read my prospectus, he knows how dramatically different <laughs> the prospectus and the final product are. Um, but when I began interviewing ancien combattant veteran um, of the Terrailleurs Center, the preponderance of them had served in Indochina and Algeria. And that made me cast net a bit further and ask a question. Um, and as you mentioned previously, while I was conducting research in 2008, um, the pension debates were raging. And many ancien combattants had already been interviewed about pensions, particularly in the Veterans Bureau. In um, and what I found um, listening to their about pension debates is that their greatest concern was how to support their family and household. It was about trying to get access to greater And then I began thinking about how um, And I also was uh, Sophie Jan is a friend, um, someone I could not have done this without, um, introduced me to Afro-Vietnamese community uh, in Dakar. And it handed there in its evolution. And 
like many people, I didn't figure out what my dissertation should have been about and I finished writing it. So when I entered into the process of forming the book, I committed to. Um, unfortunately, I was at an where I didn't have to have a book tenure, um, and I had a lot of support. Many of the people in the audience. Um, Thank you. Uh, following following what you mentioned about uh, methodology and interviews. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you a question um, um, about writing about a subject that didn't interest uh, the people who wrote the documents. Uh, I mean, this is something that that uh, always, uh, always, I will always found uh, problematic. Um, and in Sarah Zimmerman's case, it's 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 obvious because uh, you know you write about women and. The army military uh, documents don't discuss women so much. Uh, one, one article I wrote about the only one article I wrote, wrote specifically about women was was because I by chance I found uh, this kind of box of documents because women were causing a lot of problems, and that's why the military was interested in them. But you know when they weren't causing problems, they were just unimportant. So I was wondering how you managed to do that um, uh, and also about the, uh, the interviews uh, you mentioned in the introduction uh, that, that you interviewed veterans uh, and and widows and I was wondering if it's uh, co coincidental or is it because when the husband is no longer around it's much easier to speak with the women uh, this is what this is for you and, and for Sarah Frank. Uh, this the same actually question about about the the stuff that you are interested in. The everyday uh, is also not that uh, I think it's it's difficult to find in archives. And you even mentioned in the gender issue that it was difficult to locate uh, information about about uh, relations with women. Um, so I'm also asking how how did you manage to deal with this uh, with this problem? Um, so maybe we'll start the other way now. So, uh, okay, Sarah Zimmerman, you can go first. Well, I'll try to keep it brief as I can. But um, the first thing I would say is, in my observations, the production of by British and French colonial empire in the African that the British actually produced a lot, many more documents that addressed women's institutions kinds of things, whereas the French did not. Um, but what, like, if you're willing to comb them, the military um, archives, military documents, actually provide a really great um, kind of variety of about, and you can kind of get at some institutions and some ideas that are rather difficult to get at outside. Um, so yes, there was an issue of combing through. I will say that learning how to read, read French handwriting and scan for the word um, did take some time. I moved to the 19th century. Um, but you know, if you're if you're willing to look, it's there. Um, and and again, these military archives are quite thick, especially if you think about the memoirs that are in the 19th um, by French. Um, about the interviews. Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, so um, I did interview wives. I should have I should have better <laughs> written that in the <laughs> in in the um, in the book itself. Um, but so I interviewed veterans. Um, widows, wives, and um, adult children, particularly the adult children of Afro-Vietnamese. Um, and more often, women who had married active soldiers were widows um, than not in the 21st century. But what comes very interesting as well is um, because of the focus on monogamy for legitimizing marriages um, within the French colonial military. Um, 
there were women who were widows of uh, African soldiers um, who were not considered legitimate wives um, because mm -hmm. of people who. Um, and so these women hadn't had the experiences of kind of living through military service because they married soldiers after they were veterans or after they were I think I should pass. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the combing through is the key to doing any history, like Ruth describes, where your people writing the reports don't care about the stuff we're interested in. I remember I cross referenced everything. I went to about 20 different archives. Um, and like my very first conference papers were really, really boring because I would be so excited to be able to say like, oh, the colonial prisoners slept in bunk beds and sometimes there was three levels because I'd found that in a whole bunch of different sources. So I could say it definitively. And I'm, I apologize to anyone who heard those papers in the early days. Um, but the problem with, problem with the interviews that I've used and the problem with all of my sources are they're all filtered through a white European lens. So even when you have the colonial soldiers leaving reports of captivity or if they escape, um, it's always either destined for a French audience or being narrated to a French soldier who then writes it up. Um, so the colonial soldiers aren't stupid. They're not going to sit down and be like, oh, yeah, it was totally taken in by the German propaganda. Loved it. Loved the Germans. And a couple of them do. and they're. And there are repercussions for that. So you have to, I guess, read between all the lines. And in order to read between the lines effectively, I think that's why you need to be able to cross-reference so many different things so that you're able to decide when there are incidents of violence, does this, are they exceptional or are they, is that kind of a general climate of fear within the PW camps? Um, because white soldiers during the invasion of France kind of slipped into um, civilian clothes and, and melted away, the Vichy regime was quite suspicious. So they set up a bureau of um, basically a bureau to interview former soldiers to make sure that their activities were legit. And as part of that, any colonial soldier who escaped was interviewed by the French, which is fantastic because you finally get some first person narratives. And also the French know because the soldiers are telling them that the Germans are letting prisoners escape and hoping to get to North Africa to kind of do German propaganda there. So these interviews, have they were in the Fond Moscou, so they weren't classified when Raphael Scheck was writing his book. Um, and I only got to use them at Vincennes because somebody let me like look at them in their office. It's the only time they've, anyway. Um, so like you said, there, we know for other captivity histories of POWs that sex, gender, um, intimate relations are a huge part of what prisoners think about, write about, do during captivity. But obviously none of the colonial prisoners are talking about that to a white French officer. So there's a huge absence in our knowledge um, and of what we can get out of those, interviews, I guess. But they're still really exciting. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask something also about uh, the point I mentioned in my introduction um, uh, about the political in implications of the study of the Syria Senegal. Uh, I mean, every every historical subject. I mean, mostly even more so in the in the nineteenth and twentieth twentieth century, the contemporary history is related somehow to politics, and uh, of course, the choice of subjects and the focus of subjects. Uh, it's always related to what's happening and you know, what's, uh, what's going on. But um, I have the feeling, uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's wrong because it's just because I, I, I 
you know, worked on these subjects for so long, but I have the feeling that in this case uh, of the Tiran Senegalais, uh, it is it is crucial. Uh, it, it affects a lot of of of, of studies about the Tiran, mine included. I'm not saying that I'm you know uh, above this stuff. I, I when I, when I went to speak with with soldiers, for example, interview soldiers, what you mentioned, Sarah Zimmerman mentioned before, I always had the feeling that they are kind of reciting. Uh, kind of a pre-prepared text that they already cited to people before me. So, uh, and this is, was always around uh, the reasons why they should uh, get their, their pensions, and uh, it was very difficult to get other other stuff out of them. Um, so, what I, what I wanted to ask is how, in to what extent was this in your mind when you've written your your books? Because you actually written them after a lot was already published. And, um, and for example, I think both of you mentioned uh, Tiaroy, for example, which was a great subject, political issue in France and uh, is being kind of discussed, uh, uh, as I said before, with much emotion. Um, and so, I, so how, do you, how do you relate your, your work to these issues? Is it important for you? Is it something you thought about? Is it something that you think is your concern at all? Or, or is our role as historians is just to try to describe the past as best as we can and, and ignore all these political questions? This is actually what I wanted to ask. So I know Sarah, Frank, you want to start? You're already here <laughs> on the big string. <laughs> um, there's a big question. Um, I think, I mean, there is a risk that my work gets um, dismissed as Islamo gauchist rhetoric coming from the United States because I talk about race um, a lot. But I think, I, don't, I didn't go into the subject trying to write a politicized history. However, you can't get away from the fact that other histories have avoided, other histories perhaps written in French have avoided certain topics. And then they're like the question of race or questions of national belonging. Um, and I think my work engages with what it means to be part of the French nation or the the greater France, and then I think that's still relevant at the moment. And I do think that a lot of the current conversations that are being held in France and in Europe and in the US about who gets citizenship, who gets to maintain their citizenship, who belongs to the nation, spring from much older questions. Um, so I do I suppose I didn't set out to be political, but I do think it engages with important stuff that we're talking about now. Also, mm -hmm. sorry, I just wanted to mention Tirhoi because I think it's so fascinating. I studied Tirhoi in two different classes in college because I guess I had really cool professors. So when it became such a big deal in the French press and like nobody has ever studied this and nobody's ever heard of it, I was like, but in my very small college in the middle of upstate New York. We were talking about this in two different disciplines. So it always seemed so strange to me that that was, yeah, that that wasn't part of a, a fairly known history. Um, I'll just say that like, um, colonialism, imperialism, and militarization are very political. Um, they extend kind of economic and technology across vast regions via violence. Um, so there are particular ways to kind of engage in the politics of those processes. Um, and marriage is a political institution um, through which to read. Um, Um, but to your question about trying to research and write this this history uh, amid um, increasingly 
uh, vitriolic debates about tension, France, legacy, no claim, that were the rage. Um, I actually found that the veterans themselves, you know, after I, I've interviewed people several times, and I, I feel as though it was much easier to talk about yeah, um, after the initial. Um, while I was conducting dissertation research, Abdullah Wad, president of Senegal, time of I was reinscribing the history of the Tiger Senegalese in public history. Um, and there was a production of several books that I'm guessing the state funded that were about how he was a friend to the ancien combatant. Um, there was also the opening of history well. Um, so there were these kind of campaigns that were ongoing in Senegal. Uh, also, Abdoulaye Wad increased the number of veterans' holidays. Um, so instead of two time or one time a year, it became four times a year, which veterans would show up to these ceremonies. So there was a kind of increasing visibility, but it was often focused on World War I and II, um, as well as the atrocity of the massacre at Chahoy. Um, and people were really surprised when I would tell them that, yes, I think they're extremely important issues, but tell me about your experience as empire. Um, and so it was, um, it was constantly there and something that I had to work with. Um, because I think that the atrocities committed in Korea and and uh, French Indochina were also terrible and need to be accounted for. And just one last comment that I thought was, um, that's kind of a sidebar, is that because of this focus on Tekayur Senegale, there has been a large kind of marginalization of North African. Um, and there were many more North African soldiers that served in the French colony than West Africa. So any of y'all out there working on your PhDs, go in that direction. Need more. That's true. Also in the Chinese soldiers, not, not much about them. So yes, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think uh, we have now just like 15 minutes left. So I'll just um, present to you some of the questions uh, uh, that Jeff's kindly grouped for me. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Sandra Abramson is asking uh, for both of you, did either of you experience pushback from the French government, government while doing your research? Uh, Sarah F. Sarah. I'm not <laughs> important enough, I don't think, um, to get pushback from no, the French no, government. No. I, I don't, don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, for the moment, no problems. Um, Sarah, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I'll just say that um, I ran into kind of different kinds of experiences and of the interest of archivists to help me or not. Um, Vincennes is kind of a, it's its own thing. I'll put that aside. Um, I found people at Chetom in Nantes extremely helpful. Um, in trying to get to what I wanted to write. I would also say that I wouldn't say French pushback, but I would say, you know, anyone who has tried to do research on the Algerian war has experienced <laughs> the unending disappointments of files that you need to file paperwork for because they are sous derogation. Um, and so, you know, the Algerian war fits in my epilogue because I couldn't, Look at files that are Senegalese serving in Algeria, um, because I think that they are still. Some of them will not be available in 2062. Um, so there are those. So you kind of when you begin to kind of wade into those kind of questions of France's legacy in Algeria, um, there was a kind of shoring up of power around the secrecy of those documents. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so a uh, question for Sarah Frank uh, from uh, Jeanne Moncon. Uh, do we have any traces of the prisoners returned home? Were they re-employed in the regular army or civil society? And do we have traces of how the experiences of prison in mainland France changed mentalities, especially in terms of the image of the colonists? This is um, a really, really good question. Um, so the final chapter of my book is called The Long Road Home, and it talks about the process of leaving POW camps and making your way home. Because you didn't get to go directly home. If you were released from captivity before November 1942, you had a very different experience than those who were released after November 1942. Um, so it's super complicated, really, really interesting. And it's kind of inspired the next project because I think it's the process of returning home, I think is much more important than perhaps we realize. Um, so were they re-employed in the regular army or in civil society? It's a huge, huge, big debate and lots of problems. Um, returning soldiers want good jobs. Um, and the French, it all comes down to the question of what colonial soldiers deserve and if they're too demanding. Um, so some do get nice jobs. Others are given basically physical labor, which they don't want to do anymore. And the French don't respond very nicely to the refusals to work. So it does cause conflicts, um, which is not unique to the French colonial context. Um, Irish soldiers returning from the British Army in the Second World War have similar kinds of issues in finding work and whether there are jobs available to them. But it's a huge question. Um, so I think I probably should stop because I see the time. It, it's you, a really you, good one. You can send, send him to write, to read the book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, Jean-Lemont had this, a question also for Sarah Zimmerman. So uh, it's about uh, uh, labor, uh, labor and, and, marry, and marriage. So the question is, uh, the army often, often displaced men within the same colony as workforce and guard circle in particular. In particular, in such situations, there were often inter-ethnic marriages between the displaced and local population. Uh, so, did the colonial administration have specific policy regarding such inter-ethnic unions? This is a great question. Um, and I would like to just state that, like, in the 19th century, um, in particular, a kind of, or up to the First World War, when Terrier Senegal were deploying and re um, whether they were engaging in war, whether they were engaging in the maintenance of empire and the labor of kind of building military infrastructure in broadly, um, there were kind of mixed attitudes on the part of the state, on the part of missionaries, and the part of those entities responding to entities, um, reactions to uh, conjugal relationships between these terrariers and agale with local men. Um, if you read um, J. Malcolm Thompson's dissertation, <laughs> but also an article that he published, um, you will see that in some cases, uh, the French military did support um, these kind of inter-African and inter-ethnic um, uh, conjugal relationships because they thought it brought stability to the institution in the 19th century, when it was much easier for Tirailleurs Senegal to kind of um, lead the institution and fade into the local. Um, this becomes different uh, the further away you get from West Africa. Um, I think that it becomes really important to kind of think about how uh, the French military uh, and various colonial officials, um, in many ways, especially in Congo and Madagascar, nearly completely divested um, their oversight of the kinds of conjugal relationships that Tiraya Senegali were in. Um, they kind of assumed that it was necessary for Tiraya Senegali to have access to conjugal relationships. Um, and when you see instances of local communities responding very negatively, it is always after there has been a great deal of 
violence and when local communities feel as though there's been a violation of marital traditions, of compensation, um, and of exploitation, rampant violence. Um, um, so the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, in terms of how government kind of view kind of inter-African or Okay. Uh, so another question is from uh, Tip Regan, uh, says there is our two great projects. Uh, and the question is for Sarah Frank. Uh, I was wondering if you could discuss the relations between prisoners from different parts of the world. Were they separated in living quarters? Did they eat together? Did they work together to escape? Uh, did the French treat different groups differently? Yes, Sarah Frank, yeah. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, it's a huge part of the debate on how are the yeah on how to house the colonial prisoners. The French have very a very clear vision of how they want the Germans to organize the camps. So they want the prisoners separated by ethnic group um, because the French believe see this come up in the documents a lot that the Senegalese are incapable of getting along with North Africans and that. Um, People from the Antilles, I think they call them contaminating bad minds at one stage. They don't want them interacting with other prisoners because they're citizens, they have rights, and they might, you know, give people ideas. And obviously the Germans don't care about how the French want to organize this. So there's some really interesting interplay. So there's the theory of how the camps should be organized, and then there's a the reality of life in smaller work camps where people do kind of get mixed together. Um, so in theory, separate living quarters in the big camps, um, they did eat together. Um, once Red Cross deliveries start getting a bit more regular, there's a bit more autonomy for um, colonial prisoners to cook their own food, which really improves morale. Um, the question of working together to escape is really interesting. It seems like most colonial prisoners escaped along ethnic lines. So at one stage, the very beginning, apparently a lot of North Africans were escaping from this one camp. I think it was APL. Um, and then the guards were like, oh, well, the Senegalese are far more trustworthy. We'll allow them to go outside of the camp to work. And then all of them escaped as well. So there's a lot of playing off of the racial generalizations and prejudices of both the French and the Germans as well. Um, yeah, I think I should probably stop there, but there's like 10 more minutes I could go on that. Thank you for the question. Okay, so uh, Jennifer Session, hi Jennifer. Uh, she asks a question about sources and access. Uh, she says the discussion of sources has been fascinating. I suspect a lot of people here are worried about questions of access to archival materials, whether because of financial and or pandemic related limitation on travel or the disastrous reclassification policies of the French military archives. Do you have any advice for colleagues or especially graduate students interested in beginning projects on experiences of colonial soldiers and their families across empire in the face of these obstacles? Uh, this is the both of you, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess I'll take that one and say, um, for those of you who are lucky enough to participate, um, the French Colonial Historical Society, of which I am the vice president, did host um, two sessions um, where uh, Isabelle Dion, the directrice of ANOM, the uh, Overseas National Archives in Aix-en-Provence, um, provided some guidance for kind of those archives. I didn't find Anon to be as useful as the military archives um, in France, uh, either at, in Vincennes or um, in uh, Chetom. Um, of course, I'm forgetting the small town, the small beach town that that is located in, and it'll come back to me, um, or conducting interviews or um, 
But that said, you could certainly try to channel. Um, I would also say that the online systems, which are a bit difficult to kind of find via searches, but the online systems for the libraries at the Ecole Militaire um, in Paris, um, as well as the Bibliothèque or the library in Vincennes, can be very useful for reading, reading to memoirs. Um, and getting access to the kinds of materials that you have to pay the other. But uh, the search engines serve. Um, um, unfortunately, there hasn't been widespread digitization of the archives in Senegal. Um, I know. I think, God, I hope we're all going to be archived soon. Um, the most useful bit of information that our advice I have is do not believe the catalogs. So when you rock up to the departmental archives of Zool and they're like, what are you doing here? Why would you want information on colonial subjects? There's nothing here for you. You say, that's cool, but I still want to look at these kind of files, these kind of files, these kind of files. And then you may end up finding amazing material, end up not. But there is a lot of, like I've heard rumors about people who wrote PhDs where all of their material was in boxes that were clearly labeled and like fit the organization of their work. I don't know what that's about. Um, if you can choose a topic like that, do it. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, what the advice should be. I think I'm also looking at some research funding that I have, whether I should be trying to find someone to take pictures for me. Should I be holding out to see if we can go? Um, I guess the only other practical advice for Vincennes is you're going to need more time than you think because sometimes they're not going to give you things. Sometimes they're going to pretend that things don't exist. Um, there's two other archives that sometimes people don't think to look at. If you're looking at the World Wars, the BDIC has a lot of material on um, French colonial soldiers, officers and things. And also they're brilliant. It's just bring a sandwich. It's desolate in Nanterre. Um, and also the BAVCC, which is the military archives in Caen, in Normandy. They have all of the like capture cards for POWs for the First and Second World Wars. They have tons of materials um, and they're not often exploited. Um, so there's really cool stuff there. I would also add, and I forgot about this, I would also add, um, it is possible that it has, there has been conversation that has happened um, in Marie d'Ivry at ECPOD Day, which they did not yeah. like me saying out loud. I forget what it stands for, but ECPA dash table. Um, and they have a kind of audio visual archive. Um, it's the 323 bus. Oh, I took the pink line and then walked up the hill. I just, just wanted to add the Fréjus archives, which are also great, I think, for Af African soldiers. Chaton, thank you. Yes, in Fréjus. In thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, you might be even invited to eat in the uh, officer's mess like me, which was fantastic. <laughs> Good food in with five euros. Okay, so uh, last question um, um, is about uh, locality in the occupied zone of Nigel Perrin. My question to like to Sarah F. Research. How different were the experiences across the zone occupied? How did specific specificities of place, locality, and proximity of local civilian population influence ex experiences of communities and POWs? That's a really, really good question. Um, and again, we have the like theoretical how it should have worked and then how it actually worked in reality. The where certain colonial soldiers could be interned is a huge debate and it comes out of the French policy of hivernage. So removing um, 
West African soldiers from the front during the First World War, during the winter months and bringing them to more Southern zones. So there's this whole legal debate between the French and the Germans on where can you have a Malian soldier in Apenal in the winter or should he be south? Are Madagascans better able to port the rigors of winter? Um, so you have all of that on kind of the top down. But then I think the specificities of place, locality, and proximity to local civilians, as you say, is absolutely imperative for shaping the colonial prisoners' experiences. So most of the time, if you're sent out on a work group, you would be, it could be two people, it could be 50 people, but you were working in, in small farms with other alongside French civilians, um, a couple of cases, you see the villages keeping the colonial prisoners, like housing them over the winter because conditions within the homes were better than conditions within the camps just during the winter months. So depending on where you lived um, had a huge impact. Again, if you were in Vesoul, you were very lucky to have an extremely active resistance network which helped a lot of um, white prisoners and then colonial prisoners or escape. Um, so depending on where you were and who you could interact with made a huge difference on, on how you survived captivity. Uh, okay, so uh, I think this was the last question. So we ran out of time. Um, I think there's so much more to say about these books, but because we don't have more time, I suggest you just all read them. Uh, and that would probably answer most of your questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Sarah Frank and Sarah Zimmerman. Uh, for me, it was a pleasure and I'm very happy because it made me read the two books. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's always, we always have to, you know, uh, need the, the, the time to do this. And I'm so glad I did it because I learned so much. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Jeff and Sally for organizing this meeting. Bye-bye.